Hello and welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women as ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is an environmentalist, a voice that is heard, followed, listened with reverence and respect in numerous committees, organizations and platforms. He's the director of the Tata Energy Research Institute and most recently was honored by the President of India with the Padma Bhushan for his work in the area of the environment. Uh, the Tata Energy Research Institute works widely in the areas of energy, biodiversity, environment, and a whole range of issues associated with sustainable development. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Arki Pachari. Dr. Pachari, we constantly hear the bad news. What's the good news in the area of environment, sustainable development? There's so much alarmist news about all that's going wrong, whether it's global warming, environment degradation, da 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 da. What's the good news? Well, the good news can be heard at a decentralized, localized level mm -hmm. and also at the global level. I mean, there's much that disturbs you, but there's enough, I think, to sort of sustain your sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. At the grassroots level, there are so many examples of people really sort of taking their destinies into their own hands mm -hmm. and doing things to restore the ecology to regenerate natural resources which have been destroyed over a period of time. Uh, at the global level, while uh, you know there's a great deal of dismay, mm -hmm. particularly with President George W. Bush's recent position mm -hmm. uh, in not wanting to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, mm -hmm. I must say there are corporations, mm -hmm. there are uh, environmental groups, mm -hmm. even in the United States, that are now getting very sensitive mm -hmm. to uh, their own responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So I think if one looks around, there's plenty of bad news, there always has been. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, there are several examples that give you a great deal of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Give us one or two sort of specific examples that, that you feel inspired by. Well, I'll give you an example with which our own mm -hmm. institute is mm -hmm. uh, associated. We are working in about 100 different villages. Mm -hmm. And the attempt is to f define and find local energy solutions mm -hmm. to problems that have existed for perhaps hundreds of years and also to sort of create an environmental space in which people can live, all kinds of species can survive. Now we worked in some very poor villages and what we try to do is to ensure that firstly you understand the energy problems of a village, then come up with a set of solutions with total participation by the community for which you necessarily have to set up an institutional structure locally. And then these communities will get involved in constructing biogas plants, in improving the efficiency of their cook stoves, mm -hmm. uh, procuring mm -hmm. solar lanterns. Now some of these things are very highly priced, so we try to get, let's say, an oil company or somebody mm -hmm. to subsidize it. Mm -hmm. But they pay for whatever we feel is reasonable from their mm -hmm. income, uh, sustainable, mm -hmm. I mean, what is sustainable mm -hmm. from the point of view of their income. Mm -hmm. And uh, you find in some of the poorest villages, people pay for these devices simply because they see a benefit in it for themselves, their children who can read in the evenings, mm -hmm. let's say with the solar lantern. You can also create entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. The local radio mm -hmm. technician, for instance, mm -hmm. becomes a repairer of solar lanterns and so on. So, you know, it's a question of uh, just giving people opportunities mm -hmm. and they rise to the occasion. And I can give you several such examples from very poor very backward, so-called backward villages, where people accept new ideas and implement them dil diligently. You lead and manage uh, an institute uh, with a substantial resource base to do empirical studies and research and to do pilot projects. Uh, and and, and uh, you, from that position, uh, lend your voice in the cause of uh, environment and, and, and sustainable development issues. How effective, how credible, how useful uh, do you think have been many of the, the other voices uh, against the Narmada Dam, uh, Meda Patkar and uh, Sundaral Bhaguna and the sort of the grassroots uh, initiatives and uh, do you sometimes feel that, 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 that they're not always uh, founded on, on empirical fact and, and perhaps more on emotion and, and may, may that have in some ways um, damaged the cause you think? Well, I have a lot of respect for all these uh, groups that you mentioned, Sundaral Bahubana, for instance. He, he's achieved an enormous amount in an area where there was all kinds of uh, cruelty 
being uh, perpetrated uh, through you know a fairly large region uh, i have a lot of respect for people who are opposed to large dams uh, because i think they have at least succeeded in highlighting a problem which otherwise would not have got any attention the whole problem of displacement of human beings we can't treat them as numbers and there's no denying the fact that in the past in several such projects uh, we have merely treated these people as statistics so i think to that extent i certainly commend some of these initiatives and and efforts made by various groups but where i don't agree with them entirely is in carrying out a fair evaluation of the costs and benefits the pluses and minuses and then arriving at a balance you see we can't go back to pastoral times the fact is we are living in a post industrial society and india cannot possibly stay behind i mean all of those people who say that uh, you don't need large dams and there are some that you don't need because you know the effects can perhaps be very very costly and very damaging but you don't throw the baby out with the bath water there are good dams and there are bad dams and i think we should be able to objectively assess uh, the good ones as well as the bad ones and then make rational choices um you have focused uh, extensively in your work on the issue of sustainable development um what do we really mean by sustainable development surely it means more than merely development that can be sustained in 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 time or or, or in, in terms of an energy audit it has a much larger philosophical and empirical basis what is this basis well that's a very good question i spent a semester teaching at <laughs> yale a masters and phd level course which i called sustainable development global context southern perspective mm -hmm. and i don't think i found any answers at the end of that semester mm -hmm. but let me highlight a few interpretations of sustainable development i mean the definition that's most commonly used is mrs brentland's uh, definition from her commission report which says that sustainable development is that form of development which needs the which meets the needs of the present generation mm -hmm. without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own need mm -hmm. the emphasis here is on needs and i think we need to start defining what constitutes the needs of a human society mm -hmm. now there are societies on this earth which are developing there are societies which are developed but there are also societies which are mal developed and i'm using a term used by paul ehrlich mm -hmm. because societies which are over consumptive in their lifestyles are clearly not pursuing a sustainable path of development I think we have to look at what we have inherited and what we can pass on to the future and I think an excessively consumptive lifestyle is certainly not going to pass on to the future what we have inherited in the past mm -hmm. so I think the 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 concept of sustainable development is not merely a question of managing the economy it's also a question of managing human behavior and I think this is something that we lose sight of I think sort of uh, the assumption of, of, of economic management of, of budgets uh, has been that in in some ways you can predict uh, human behavior, you can predict human responses uh, by uh, government policy, by government initiatives, uh, and and achieve to a degree of social engineering through that 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 kind of uh, uh, structure. And and what you're referring to here in terms of a uh, human uh, patterns of human consumption is is very elemental in a sense it's the basis of of of, of the current prevailing capitalist doctrine uh, how do we begin this process of social engineering well i think since you referred to the budget you referred to fiscal policy i think all of this can make an enormous difference in influencing human actions in a particular direction or the other uh, for instance uh in our annual budget mm -hmm. i have been highlighting for years now mm -hmm. the fact that our taxation of let's say household appliances mm -hmm. should be based on a differential that's related to the efficiency of the appliance if somebody produces an energy efficient refrigerator mm -hmm. then i think the taxation on that should be much lower mm -hmm. than one which is not efficient i think you've sort of most pointedly mm -hmm. uh, emphasized this on 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 taxes on on on, on vehicles that's right. being a more dramatic expression exactly. Uh, of this exactly 
You see, I think you can influence human behavior, certainly consumption decisions, by the right set of taxes and incentives that the budget can provide. And I think we need to create public awareness to influence the decision of governments mm -hmm. uh, in this particular direction. Do you uh, feel that uh, despite the sort of the common sense appreciation that many of us have of the implications of, of the issues that we're discussing, that it doesn't really translate into action, hasn't substantially uh, translated into, into truly significant policy initiatives, either at national or international levels. You yourself said that it's really at the grassroots level, a few groups and people who are doing this. Yes, I think that there is um, a great deal of uh, truth in what you say. And I find it disturbing at times that, you know, we are really blindly aping the countries of the North. And there's nothing wrong with doing that provided we also combine it with the sort of social responsibility that you find particularly, say, in the Scandinavian countries, or even countries in Europe, or Japan for that matter. Uh, we seem to be completely ignoring that aspect of their development and are only going in for the path of excessive consumption. Now, that's dangerous because it not only carries with it uh, an enormous hazard in terms of the social tensions that could arise in India, but it also, I think, would lead to a plundering of natural resources. Because if everybody wants to consume more and more, and we are not able to satisfy everybody's demands, then what are we going to do? We'll just start, um, we'll just start plundering the resources of the earth. And uh, essentially, we'll become parasites on nature. And that's certainly not in our interest or that of our children and grandchildren. Uh, you know, we, we, we tend to hold uh, largely the, the, the countries of the North uh, responsible for the degradations, certainly at the, at the, at the global level. And uh, how do we begin to influence, uh, impact um, the North uh, through sort of bringing traffic to a halt in Seattle and, 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 and creating protests? How effective is that? What are the strategies that we have available to us? Well, I think that certainly is a strategy which I won't advocate, but I think it's very effective. But I think far more than that, what we also need to do is to develop linkages and relationships with sane and rational groups in the North. It's for this reason that in my institute, we've set up a unit in Washington, D.C. that was 10 years ago. Uh, we have one in Europe. We have one in Russia. Of course, Russia is going through a period of uh, turmoil. Uh, one in Japan. Because I think we can work with groups in uh, these, these countries. Uh, just to give you an example, a week from now, mm -hmm. I'll be addressing a group of people from industry in the US in Washington, DC, mm -hmm. as part of the US-India Business Council. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk to them about poverty. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, poverty has something that appeals to the conscience of every human mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. You've got to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But one would also like to tell these people that here is a section of society which also gives you market opportunities, whether it's tea or soap or, or you know, uh, equipment that can help them to enhance their income. These are things that I think in this age of globalization people should be sensitive to. So uh, the point I'm trying to make is that you really need to stretch out in several directions. And I see no reason why Indians should be apologetic of what we can offer. We're not very proud of everything that we're doing, and for good reason. Mm -hmm. But there is at the same time a great deal that we can offer to the countries mm -hmm. of the North. Mm -hmm. Let's start doing that. Mm -hmm. that and, and, and explain this to me. Uh, it, it seems that the more we begin to talk about developing markets, uh, the more we seem to be looking at the issues of creating more consumption, creating more demand uh, for goods and services. Uh, yes, inevitably, it, will, it, it, it enables the elimination of poverty, which is a form of uh, uh, abuse of the environment in some ways, uh, but it, 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 we, we, we're trying to, in a sense, persuade the West that, look, by doing this, you're going to get more economic benefit and hence be able to consume more. It seems a never-ending uh, cycle in, in, in some ways. No, I think it's a very, very complex challenge, and I don't see any simple solutions to this. But I think it would be tragic for a society like India to lose its traditional values and go blindly aping the countries of the North. There is much that we can learn from the countries of the North. One of the things that I admire greatly in North America, for instance, is their higher edu education system. 
I mean, it's uh, phenomenally productive. It's, uh, it's, it's really a melting pot of so many ideas, so many innovative things that happen over there, which really fuels the growth of the industry, all the innovation that takes place in that society. We have not even been able to set our own institutions of higher learning in order. I mean, they've gone through a period of decay. Take a case like Allahabad University, one of the top most universities in the world, I would say. Where is it now? So I think we really need to create some of these centers of intellectual influence in our country, which I'm sure will have an impact on the way we develop, the way we grow. And I hope uh, this will happen sooner rather than later, otherwise it may be too late. Uh, would you say it's, it's a fair assumption that, um, uh, that, that given the, the, the economic imperative that seems to drive and dictate uh, uh, decisions and then the political will, that uh, it is only when uh, the notion of sustainable development or uh, being eco-friendly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, becomes economically attractive uh, that it will really find uh, uh, expression and implementation? I think you're right. It's for this reason that, you know, uh, six years ago we launched a major program called Green India 2047, mm -hmm. where we decided to estimate the damage that had been done to the, the country's natural resources and therefore its economic implications in the first 50 years of independence. Mm -hmm. And we found to our horror that over 10% of the GDP of the country is being lost in the form of environmental impacts and costs, which is enormous. I mean, you can't ignore that. And what we really need to do is to bring environmental issues into the mainstream of economic decision making. Once the rationale of that can be demonstrated and estimated, then I think economic policy will perhaps come to grips with this issue of sustainability. I think that's a very important part. And that's why I believe that one has to work on different fronts. You create models at a decentralized level in villages, at the grassroots level. You need to influence policy in the right direction. You need international linkages. It's an enormous and stupendous task. Mm -hmm. You seem almost intimidated by it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, look at that. that uh, it's called the Tata Energy Research Institute, and, 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 and energy is an area of your concern uh, and in, in interest, amongst many others. Uh, inevitably, economic development involves consumption of energy. We need lots of energy. And uh, you have written extensively about renewable energy. Uh, what is renewable energy? How feasible, how viable is it? Uh, we really haven't been wildly successful anywhere in the world uh, with uh, solar energy, wind energy, what have you. It hasn't really proved practical. So what is your energy model? Well, it started happening. You know, if you look at wind energy, for instance, um, there have been technological developments that have made it possible to generate power from using wind mm -hmm. at costs that are fairly competitive with conventional power uh, generation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we have over a thousand megawatts of wind capacity in this country. Mm -hmm. Europe is way ahead of us. Um, I think initially you do need incentives of various kinds. You may even need some subsidies. Mm -hmm. But then these subsidies can prove counterproductive if you allow them to stay. Mm -hmm. So you really need a road map of how you're going to make something economically viable and commercially mm -hmm. acceptable, uh, even though you might give it some uh, support from the state initially. So that started happening. But you know, if you look at very simple technologies like solar water heating, in the city of Delhi, there is no rationale, no justification whatsoever to use electricity for geysers that we have in our homes. Mm -hmm. If you add solar water heaters, it will be far cheaper. It will also lower the demand for power during periods of peak mm -hmm. demand, which is when mm -hmm. we have to mm -hmm. carry out load shedding and blackouts and uh, brownouts and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and if you look at villages, mm -hmm. we're giving electricity almost free of cost mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, that really doesn't provide a level playing field mm -hmm. for renewable sources of energy. Mm -hmm. But if you were to cost the power that goes to, let's say, a pump set in a village, mm -hmm. it's hugely expensive. If you were charging the farmer the true price, he would much rather go for a renewable energy based system. And if there is, you know, it's a chicken and egg kind of situation. If there's a large enough demand, then there'll be economies of scale, costs would come down, you'll get much better after sales service and so on. You've got to somehow get this 
whole program rolling. Mm -hmm. And we haven't shown much imagination mm -hmm. in, in achieving that. Mm -hmm. But I'm reasonably sure that that's the way to go in the future. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you replace conventional fuels, mm -hmm. but you have to start a transition mm -hmm. which over a period of time mm -hmm. on economic merits alone mm -hmm. will allow these technologies to work and to develop. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we, re we, we, we record this conversation uh, uh, here in Delhi and you've mentioned uh, the use of uh, uh, solar heaters here. Uh, what is it that inhibits us uh, from, from following through with this? Uh, what are the problems? What are the, well, the obstacles uh, to, to this happening, to its acceptance amongst a relatively educated, uh, affluent, high per capita incomes uh, population? Well, firstly, we really don't have good models of solar water heaters. We don't have an industry that will give you the right kind of installation service, the after-sales service. And this is where you really can create an industry by doing the kinds of things that Israel has done, for instance. Mm -hmm. In Israel, no house can be given mm -hmm. a completion certificate unless mm -hmm. it's installed a solar water heater. Mm -hmm. You can have an electrical backup, mm -hmm. but it's essential to install a solar water heater. Mm -hmm. The result is that an industry has developed that supplies this particular mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. and it functions extremely well. When, as, as, as a sort of um, an activist in the field, someone who has spent virtually a, a lifetime pursuing this goal, what is your worst nightmare um, in, in, in this area? Oh dear, there's so many, <laughs> ni there's so many nightmares. Um, I would say that there's really no reason for any, um, any uh, fears on this, uh, on this score because I feel optimistic that the extent of awareness that's spreading through mm -hmm. society and the fact that in so several respects you see a resurgence of our own cultural values, uh, one would at least like to believe that we can manage some of these bugbears, these nightmares and encounter them successfully as, as they come in the future. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm right, mm -hmm. but frankly, I don't see any reason for pessimism at all. Uh, one has concerns, mm -hmm. uh, one, has, uh, one has some objections to things that are happening, but I believe that those objections can be removed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, uh, it's time that society and civil society starts asserting itself so that um, we influence policy and, uh, and through peer pressure, human behavior in a direction that would really uh, see us move towards our goal of sustainable How much of this is based in, in, in your faith in, in human nature and, and how much of it in technology and, and, and the products of science? I would say that this is based on a combination of both really because technology, I believe, uh, can be a major agent of change, mm -hmm. even in terms of removal of poverty. Mm -hmm. I think the days are gone when you talked about appropriate technology mm -hmm. uh, as being several notches mm -hmm. below mm -hmm. what is available at the sophisticated level. Mm -hmm. Today, the fruits of sophisticated science and technology mm -hmm. can be reached to the poorest and the most deprived persons. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what we should be focusing on, mm -hmm. whether it's information technology, uh, that in, involves, uh, say, mm -hmm. telephones without wires, mm -hmm. um, computer technology, mm -hmm. uh, agricultural technology, renewable energy technologies. I think we have to somehow now empower local communities mm -hmm. to make these choices mm -hmm. and use the fruits of science and technology mm -hmm. to bring about a major change in their, their livelihoods. And given the context of uh, global interdependence, uh, what strategies and techniques do you feel are available to the South? Um, because they are the, are, are the dominant cultures, they are the dominant economies, uh, they are the dominant systems which can uh, overwhelm uh, the, the, the impact or the, or the advantages of our relatively meager initiatives. So what mechanisms do you think uh, can substantially impact that and then we can see, begin to see tangible results. How do you go about persuading President Bush? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I would say that, you know, you really can't give up on any human being and particularly if he's in that position, it's almost essential that you make every effort to change his thinking. But he represents the apex of the system of a point quite of view. Quite right, quite right. And basically what one would have to do is, as I said earlier, 
you've got to engage the rational voices and see that they are heard, even in the countries of, uh, of the North. Now, for instance, uh, Gus Peth, who was the first president of the World Resources Institute, is now a dean at Yale, and we are very good friends and colleagues. He's holding a meeting in early June. He has been trying to get in touch with several people who may have access to President Bush. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really need to start networking. Mm -hmm. And seeing that some sane and rational voices mm -hmm. uh, are heard in the White House, are heard in the Senate, it will take an enormous effort. And I think that's why it is necessary for scientists, researchers, mm -hmm. academics, mm -hmm to get out into the real world today. It's not enough to do research in ivory towers. Mm -hmm. And it's for this reason that we have always, always pursued an approach where we try to take the fruits of our research mm -hmm. uh, either to industry or to civil society or to policy makers. Mm -hmm. Because unless you can see some outlet mm -hmm. and some tangible benefit from what you're doing, mm -hmm. I think you're just wasting your time. You've had an enormously uh, successful and influential career uh, in impacting and, and, and shaping policy uh, across a broad spectrum of issues related uh, to, to what we have been uh, discussing. You have a long uh, career still ahead of you, but when you're ready to retire and, and, and put your feet up, what is the one flag uh, that you want to feel proud uh, to have waved? Well, firstly, I don't think I've had any influence. I don't think I've, I've had any great successes. Yes, uh, I have been very satisfied with the institution that I've been associated and with. And you have been on virtually every national committee of significance and consequence that's that evaluating counts. and looking policy. <laughs> if, if that counts. Uh, but I really have not been able to contemplate a period when I'm going to retire. Now, do, you have, do you have one single abiding passion that you want yes. to go and hammer in? No, I just want to write once I retire. Uh -huh. And I would like to write fiction. Some people may say I do that even today. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I write worse. I'd like to yeah. sit down and do that. Uh -huh. And uh, basically write about nature, write about the things that might be able to move human minds and hearts mm -hmm. to understand what we are doing to this planet. And um, I really haven't decided how I'm going to go, go about it. But you know, at some stage, as you say, when I put my feet up, I'll certainly put my head down and start <laughs> writing about these things. And um, that's it's a long 